Oh, we should be recording. Fantastic. Now. Okay, Thank you so I will much. share my screen now. So hopefully we can all see that slide there. Um, so first of all, welcome. Hello, as my colleague Emma said, my name is, is Dr. Aidan Seeley, and I am a senior lecturer here at Swansea University Medical School. And I'm also the deputy program director for the BSc Medical Pharmacology program. So really, that's a really complicated way of saying, I love drugs. I love studying drugs. I love working with drugs in the lab. I am a drug geek. I love working out how drugs work, why they don't work, and how we can improve therapies. And one of the ways we can do that is by using human cell culture. So that is the purpose of today's lecture. It should only take sort of 25, 30 minutes to run through. We have a video demonstration from some of our PhD students and researchers in the medical school at the end of the session. So we can actually see it being done in real life as it's done here at Swansea University Medical School. But what I'll do is kind of set the scene, explain what I mean by cell culture, why it's important, why we use it, how we've been using it in the past and how we are using it currently and the applications for that in the future. So the aim of today's lecture is to have a very brief overview on what human cell biology is how we can then ultimately grow cells in the lab and describe the process that we undertake to deliver cell culture in the lab. And this gives us a really amazing opportunity to research parts of humans in the lab because it's not really ethical for us just to inject loads of new drugs into people. We have to go through really robust screening processes and make sure that these drugs are safe. So even these new COVID vaccines and all of these amazing new therapies that are coming to the market all go through these really rigorous processes and absolutely will have been done in human cell cultures prior to then being put into the clinic. And we're also going to look at some really amazing examples of how we have used cell culture in medical research and arguably the most pivotal one at the moment is how we've been using it in COVID. Now I'm not going to touch on that today for the simple reason I feel like we're all just COVID exhausted. That's all we hear about all the time. So we're going to look at some other examples and we're not going to have COVID fatigue for today. So what's really interesting about cells and in our body, we tend to just kind of say, well, there's cells. We've got human cells. They're everywhere. But our cells are so diverse. So things like our neurons and our nerve cells, so the cells in our brains and the cells in our nervous system are really strange shapes. They've got this cell body, they've got these long projections, and then they've got all of these what look like tentacles coming out of the bottom and at the top. And this allows our cells to communicate with each other extremely rapidly. It allows us to have conscious thought, to have memory, but also with the nerve cells, it allows us then, if we touch something hot, you'll retract your hand really quickly. And that's what we would call a spinal reflex. It doesn't go to the brain. So if you've ever touched a hot kettle or a hot stove, your hand will pull away and then you'll be like, oh, that was hot. There was a pause between that. That's because these nerves are firing in the spine before they then reach the brain and you realize that's going on. But not all cells look like that. So we have things like red blood cells. So these don't have a nucleus. They look very different in size, very different in shape, and obviously very different in function. And then things like white blood cells, again, very different in shape, size, and function. Then we have all these other cells, so things that are lining our intestines, our gastrointestinal tracts. We've got bone cells. I am a huge fan of bone cells. I used to work in a bone research lab. People think of skeletons and bones as being dull, hard, rock-like substances that don't really do anything, but bone cells are super cool, and arguably they're more connected than the brain, so I think they're awesome. But hopefully, if you join us on the medical pharmacology program, you'll get some lectures on the bone cells, and you'll go, okay, bone cells are awesome as well. And then there's other really specialized cell types. So things like the ovum or the egg cell and obviously cells like sperm cells. So we have all of these different cells and different functions. So how on earth can we grow them in the lab? And how can we research these in the lab setting? Now, despite the fact that these cells are different in size, shape and function, they have a lot of common features. And you will be aware, or if you've not done sort of A-level biology or equivalent, Broadly speaking, despite the fact that these cells are very different in function, shape, and size, they have very similar structures, broadly speaking. So they have a cell membrane, and this is the phospholipid bilayer, 
which is this uh, sort of fatty layer that lines outside of cells, which separates the inside from the outside environment. So if you imagine putting some olive oil on top of a glass of water, it creates a fatty layer on top of the water. Imagine that in a little sphere and you've got your cell membrane, this phospholipid bilayer. You may also know it as a fluid mosaic model because it's proteins and stuff all spaced through it. But the cell membrane, all of our cells have those. Slightly different composition between the cell lines, but broadly the same structure. Most cells have a nucleus, red blood cells don't, but broadly speaking, most cells have a nucleus and that is the site of our genomic information, our DNA. Now there is a slight exception to that rule and that is the mitochondrial DNA. So we do, some, we do have some DNA in our mitochondria, but the vast majority is housed in our nucleus. So this is where all of our DNA is held and that is the bit that makes you, you. It controls protein, it controls your, gene, your genes, and ultimately it gives those cells that function and those cells make up you. Now the mitochondria are then the site of the production of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, that really important energy molecule that our cells use in order to utilize energy. So if you are familiar with ATP, adenosine triphosphate, has three phosphate groups, the triphosphate, and it's that third phosphate that has this really high energy bond that when it breaks, it releases all of this energy. So you can kind of think of that third phosphate bond as a glow stick. So when you crack that glow stick, it starts to glow and release light, release that energy. So that third phosphate bond of ATP is essentially like cracking that glow stick. So the mitochondria produces all of this amazing ATP for ourselves to use. And as I mentioned, it's also the site of our mitochondrial DNA. Now, just as a, a very slight aside, and it shows you that the fact that we, we've known about cells for a long time. We've known about mitochondria for a long time. We've known about the nucleus for a long time. And we always believed that you inherit your mitochondrial DNA only from your mum. So your nucleic, um, your, your nucleus DNA, the genomic DNA, comes half from your mum, half from your dad. But the mitochondrial DNA was always believed to only come from your mum. But we're now starting to find evidence that some of it might actually come from your dad. So we've known about this for a long time and we're still learning more and changing some really uh, sort of long-held traditional ideas with more research. So we know a lot, but we're learning more as we go. The endoplasmic reticulum, which is the site for protein production then. So we have our genes, our genes make protein, and the endoplasmic reticulum is that sort of packaging site for producing all of that protein and shipping it out. So you can kind of think of that as kind of like the Amazon warehouse. And then the Golgi apparatus allows those proteins to go to the right place. It's a site of secretion. It moves the proteins around inside the cell. So essentially, you can then think of the Golgi apparatus as your Amazon delivery guy, bringing things from the Amazon warehouse to your house where it needs to be. So we've got lots of different metaphors there from glow sticks to Amazon. I'm sure we're all uh, getting a bit sick of Amazon being the only thing we can really buy from. But Now, when we're talking about human cells, these are kind of the smallest building blocks we have in our, in our body. Obviously we get smaller because we've then got proteins and then we've got atoms and we can go smaller and smaller and smaller. But from a human biology perspective, we're gonna say that cells are kind of the smallest component. But those cells arrange themselves into tissues. Lots of cells will form a tissue and then those tissues will form an organ. So in this example here, we've got a cell such as a cardiomyocyte. So it's a very specific cell found and it's a very specific muscle cell found in things like the heart, the cardiovascular system. Those then form muscle tissue and those muscle tissues then form the organ, such as the heart. And then you get the formation of the organ system. So you've got the heart, but then you've got the cardiovascular system. So all of the arteries, veins, arterioles, all of those things that make up the cardiovascular system to get your blood moving around your body, allowing oxygen to reach all of those different bits of your body and ultimately then allowing your tissues to receive oxygen and continue to function as normal. But we also then have populations. So you have these organ systems forming organisms, which are us, and then lots of organisms forming a population. So you then got that collective group of people. So lots of cells, tissue, lots of tissue, organ, organ, organ systems, organisms, populations. So 
huge scale there. The issue when it comes to us researching people is we can't ethically just grow a person in the lab. If we want to test a drug on someone, we can't just say, right, let's make a new one. We'll whack the drug in and we'll see what happens. If it works, great. If it doesn't and they die, who cares? That's not what we can do. It's not ethical. Uh, so we obviously cannot do that. So we need alternative methods in order to test drugs before we give it to people. If we just gave untested drugs to the population, people would get sick, some people might even die because we don't know if that drug works or if that drug is safe. And so we can kind of work our way around that by growing bits of people, such as cells or tissues and testing it in those cells and tissues first. Now, this is not new. We haven't just thought recently, oh, what if we just grow a bit of a person? In fact, we've been doing it for a very long time. And this was first demonstrated way back in 1887 by Wilhelm Rue. So you're going back a huge amount of time to think about the idea of growing bits of people in a lab. This has been going on for what, 130 years. That's mad. And the way he done it was keeping embryonic chick cells alive in saline, so salt, salty water, salty solution, for a couple of days. So essentially taking uh, an egg, cracking it open and taking those cells out of a fertilized egg and allowing them to grow in the lab in saline for a couple of days. However, that's not really that applicable. They don't last for very long and ultimately after a few days those cells started to die. So then in 1907, Ross Harrison grew tissues successfully outside of the body and managed to grow embryonic frog nerve fibers, so nerve cells responsible for those conduction, those electrical currents passing through to activate uh, muscles and to allow us to perceive our environment. Ross Harrison was able to grow these in media, essentially a lovely salty and sugary solution with everything that cells need to survive, and he managed to grow these frog nerve cells in uh, a media environment. And then things really changed in 1912, so over 100 years ago now, where Alexis Carell grew slides on glass plates. Now, you will have likely have seen, if you've ever watched the news and they're talking about this new drug or this new cancer therapy, there's always someone in the lab and there's always someone with a Petri dish putting stuff on the Petri dish or in this sort of hood doing science. And they're normally working on tissue culture plastics. We don't use glass anymore, well, sometimes we do, but the vast majority of times we use plastics. But in 1912, this was the first time that we were able to grow cells in glass or on glass plates in the lab. And this was the first example of being able to keep cells and tissues continuously growing in the lab. So we've been doing this for a very long time. The issue with growing cells in the lab after we kind of worked out how do we do it, how do we grow them on a, a piece of glass, was actually that cells would grow for a while and then they would suddenly stop. And for a long time, we didn't really know why cells would survive and keep growing and keep growing and then just stop. It's not like someone says, okay, no more, please stop. These cells just seem to have a natural clock which stopped them from growing anymore. And we now know this is because of something called the Hayflick limit. And this is named after the scientist who discovered it, Leonard Hayflick. And this is a very normal and extremely tightly regulated and essential part of normal human cells. So all of our cells in our body are actually um, subject to the Hayflick limit as long as we're fit and healthy. When cells stop adhering to the Hayflick limit, we start to have formation of disease. But essentially, this is a very normal process to stop cells from dividing too much or for too long. And this Hayflick limit is a finite number of divisions. So one cell becoming two, two cells becoming four, and on and on and on. Your cells can only do that so many times before the cell cannot divide anymore and it'll die. Now, one of the biggest breakthroughs in medical research was the development of the HeLa cell line. 
And it's named Gila because it was originally isolated from an amazing woman called Henrietta Lacks back in 1951. Now, Henrietta Lacks had a very severe um, cervical cancer and cells were taken as a biopsy by her doctor. Now, she was married to a tobacco farmer from a very poor part of America. And as a result, she didn't have access to very good healthcare. So she had the cervical cancer and cells were taken as a biopsy. And the doctor then tried to grow these cells in culture. So he took this biopsy, it was particularly aggressive, and he thought, I wonder if I can grow them in culture, if I can grow them in a lab. Now, unfortunately, Henry Ethelax did die of cervical cancer as a result of the aggressive nature of the tumour, but her cells were the first cell line not to adhere to the Hayflick limit, and they kept growing and kept growing and kept growing and kept growing. And the fact that these cells didn't have that Hayflick limit and they could keep growing and growing and growing meant we were suddenly able to grow cells indefinitely in a lab. So we could grow them on a glass plate, have these cells and test things on them. And in fact, Henrietta Lacks now is considered to be more alive than she was when she was alive. And it is predicted that we have grown 10,000 tons of these cells since they were first isolated in 1951. Almost every lab in the world will have HeLa cell lines somewhere because they're so quick and so easy to grow so we can test lots of things on them. And in fact, she's contributed to amazing breakthroughs in things such as the polio vaccine. Now, the surrounding story around Henrietta Lacks and the isolation of the HeLa cell lines is actually quite tragic because it was taken without permission and without consent. And there's an amazing book by Rebecca Sklut called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which I thoroughly recommend you to read. And it outlines some of the ethical considerations we have to have as scientists and as clinicians, and what the important considerations are for patients, but also outlines the amazing studies that have been done because of this isolation of Henrietta Lacks' cervical cancer. So we owe a lot of our everyday life to this amazing woman. As I say, she is now technically more alive than she ever was when she was alive. So what is cell culture? We briefly spoke about kind of how it works, what's the point of it, who's been trying to do it in the past, but what actually is it? So cell culture is the removals of cells from an animal or a plant and growing them in an artificial environment. So taking cells from Henrietta Lacks and growing them in a lab. Now, this is the type of setup that you will likely have seen if you're watching BBC News at six o'clock and they're talking about the new medical breakthrough. All of these pretty colours, all these pretty plastics. But this is cell culture. So in these flasks, on these plates, there are cells growing on them. And that red liquid, which kind of looks a bit like Lucozade, is growth media filled with sugars and salt and amino acids to allow the cells to grow. And cells will continue to grow until they reach a process known as senescence. And that's kind of when they get a bit tired and they stop growing. So they just stop, similar to the Hayflick limit. And this is when cells then lose the ability to grow and divide. And this period of senescence, this limited number of cell divisions is likely to be an evolutionary mechanism to prevent us catching diseases such as cancer or developing diseases such as cancer. You can't really catch it. Um, because if you think about it, if these cells keep growing and dividing, growing and dividing, growing and dividing nonstop, you're going to have formation of things like tumours. And that's then obviously going to develop to cancer. And so that's very dangerous and can it ultimately result in um, death of patients. So we've likely developed these mechanisms where cells can only grow so much before they stop in order to keep us fit and healthy. Now, when we are growing cells in culture, we use this really specific equipment in order to make sure that the cells survive and that they're happy and that they're growing. So most cells will grow and divide when cultured under optimal conditions. So essentially, we need to give them lots of really good stuff to keep them alive. This is things like the salts, sugars and amino acids that are in that red liquid, so growth media. We need to keep them at a good temperature and we use 37 degrees Celsius as standard. Normally, if this was in person, I would ask you, why do we use 37 degrees Celsius? So you can give a little ponder about it. 
It's because it's our body temperature. So we keep our cells at body temperature because that's what they're used to. They like to be nice and warm, so they'll continue to grow. We also have to give them gases. We respire, we breathe, so we need to give them the correct gases in order to allow them to continue to grow and survive for us to use these cells in the lab. Now, what happens is if you imagine you've got a cell dish and you put a couple of cells on it, those cells are going to grow and divide, grow and divide, grow and divide, and eventually they're going to fill that plate up. And so what happens is, is we need to move them from that plate and either take some off and move them to another or remove some from that plate to allow the others to continue to grow. Now, by doing that, we do a process called passaging or splitting cells. So we take some out and we move them to a new plate or to a new flask to allow them to grow. So essentially we take one flask and we can split it into two. Half of the cells go in one, half of the cells go in the other, and then we can uh, allow them to grow. So we can expand the amount of cells that we've got in the lab. Now, cells such as HeLa will continuously grow as long as we give them everything they need. So as long as we're giving them the salts, sugars, amino acids, gases, and space, these cells will continue to grow and to grow and to grow. And that's why things like HeLa cell lines, we've been able to grow up to an estimated 10,000 tons of them because they just grow and divide, grow and divide. So we can have a cell line in a flask, we can move it into two flasks, give them new food, and then move them into new flasks after a couple of days and then keep going and keep going and keep going and exponentially increase the amount of cells that we have for our medical research. Now that means that cells are immortal. Henrietta Lacks' cell lines are immortal because we can just keep growing them and keep growing them and keep growing them because they don't adhere to the Hayflick limit and they keep growing. So if that doesn't excite you about cell culture and cell lines, the fact that we have immortal things growing in the lab that will keep growing and keep surviving forever, I don't know what will. Every time I talk about cell lines and we get to say that cell lines are immortal, I find that amazing. So we have really managed to uh, make the, the medical fountain of youth, as it were, and we have immortal cells growing in the lab all around the world. Now, cell lines are often derived from a primary source, so this is essentially coming from a patient or a patient biopsy, and they can either naturally be immortal, so things like HeLa cell lines are naturally immortal, that was a very aggressive tumour, so it didn't adhere to the Hayflick limit and keeps growing and dividing. But now that we understand things like the Hayflick limit, we can artificially make cell lines immortal. So we can play around with their genes to stop the Hayflick limit and allow cells to keep growing and dividing. So we can induce immortality in cells, which I think is amazing. If that doesn't excite you, I really don't know what will. So we can take samples from people like Henrietta Lacks and we can grow them and just exponentially increase them. And we've now managed to do that so that even if you take cells from a healthy person without a cancer, you can induce immortality in some cases for those cells to keep growing and dividing. Now, there is lots of different types of cells in the body. Neurons, red blood cells, white blood cells, sperm, ovum, all these different cell types. But broadly speaking, when we're talking about cell culture, there's only really two types of cells. There is those cells which are adherent, and those are the ones that require to be stuck down, to stick to a vessel, to stick to the plate or stick to the glass. And they grow in something known as a monolayer. And what that means is they form a layer of cells that is one cell thick. So mono, one, mono layer. So one cell thick number of cells. They don't grow on top of each other. They're not like bunk beds. They're not all going to crawl all over each other. They grow and become one cell thick until they fill the whole area of the plate and when there's no space left we describe that plate as being confluent. The cell is completely jam-packed, there's no room for any other cells. That has formed a monolayer, they're all stuck down to the plate and there's no room left. So growth in the case of adherent cells, those that stick down to the plate, is limited by the surface area. Put them on a big plate, they'll keep growing and dividing. Put them on a bigger plate, they'll keep growing and dividing. Put them on an even bigger plate and they'll keep growing and dividing. 
but it does mean that if we're working with adherent cells, if we want to move them from one plate to another, we have to get them off the plate first because they're stuck down. So we need to get them to come off that plastic, to come off the glass in order for us to move them into a bigger plate or a bigger dish. So we have to uh, have a period of detachment where we kind of lift them off the plate. As I say, broadly in cell culture, there is two types of cells, those which are adherent and those which are suspension cells. And suspension cells float in the media. So they do not stick down to the plate because they are cells like red blood cells, which we have floating around our body anyway. Other cells that are adherent are ones like our skin or our bone cells. They kind of stick together, so they stick down. The floating cells are suspension cells. They float around in the media. So their growth is not limited by the area, but by the number of cells in the, the area. So the concentration of cells, essentially, how many cells can you pack into that volume? Now, cells are cultured in growth media. And I mentioned this when we were looking at the uh, timeline for how we developed cell culture methods. And so we need to have a number of things in this media for cells to grow all of these salts, sugars, and amino acids. So we have this media and it's given really fun names like DMEM and RPMI because scientists likes to make it sound complicated. It's really not. RPMI stands for the Roslyn Park Memorial Institute or institution, uh, which is where they made it. So it sounds really complicated, but it's just saying where they made it. Um, but this contains all the salt, sugars, vitamins, amino acids, everything you need in, to, to grow healthy cells. So you can think of this as their food supply, the media. We will also, in a lot of cases, grow them with antibiotics. And the reason for that is because everything that our cells need to grow is everything that bacteria and fungi and yeast also need to grow. So we can keep things like antibiotics in the media to allow our cells to continue to grow but not allow bacteria and things to grow. So things like penicillin and streptomycin can be added in order to try and prevent contamination. So we're only growing human cells and nothing else in the cell media. And we also add in things like growth factors and essential nutrients. So this is often things like fetal bovine serum. Essentially, this is a liquid chock full of proteins which tell cells to grow and divide, grow and divide. So essentially it's all this lovely uh, growth factors that just keep telling cells, please keep growing until you've run out of space. Um, so we add that in as well. So it speeds up the process. Cells will kind of grow without it, but they grow much faster with um, things like fetal bovine serum or FBS. Now, as I said, when we're talking about adherent cells, they're stuck to the plate. So if we want to move them onto another plate because they need more space to grow, we need to lift them off the plate. We need to get them off the glass, get them off the plastic. And so we need to remove them from that plate. And we do this so we can passage our split cells. So we take one flask and we split it into two, two into four, four into eight flasks. Now, we can do this by using enzymes such as trypsin, which is the digestive enzyme that we make in our stomach. So essentially, you kind of digest the cells a little tiny bit and the cells go, oh, I don't like this, and they lift off the plate. Now, oh, what's going on here? So they all scrunch up and they start to float in the media, and then we can collect them from there. Or what you can do is use a little cell scraper, which is essentially like a window squeak, squeak, squeegee. That's what I would call it anyway. Uh, and I will do my what I think is my best impression of any piece of scientific apparatus. When you scrape them, it goes and you scrape off the cells. So there you go. If that is essentially how my Christmas dinners go, where I say, do you want to hear my impression of a cell scraper? Um, but you scrape them off, essentially. And you can then move them into new flasks and you can grow more cells. Now, when we're growing cells in, we need a number of very specialist equipment. We need a sterile flow cabinet. And in the video that I'm going to show you in just a couple of minutes, you will see this. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in sterile environment, in sterile air, in order to make sure that you're not getting loads of bacteria, yeast and fungi in it. So I'm not going to spend too much time explaining that. We also need a gas incubator, so a CO2 incubator to allow the cells to have all the gas that they need in order to survive. We need somewhere to put them, so cell culture flasks. You might need a water bath 
So loads of people will warm up their media. We normally keep media in the fridge. So that's about four degrees. If your cells are at 37 degrees, you don't want to be getting really cold liquid on them. So what we do is we warm everything up for them. So essentially nice warm media. They're all nice and happy, nice and cozy. Uh, and they continue to grow and divide. You'll need microscopes because you'll need to look at the cells and see how they are. Do they look healthy? Is there anything else growing there that shouldn't be? And are the cells confluent? Have they filled the plate up? And do they need to be split? So you'll need things like microscopes to see them. And then pipettes to move liquids from one bottle to another, to put it on the dish, to put it into the bottle, X, Y, Z. Now the dreaded fear of every scientist doing cell culture is the fear of contamination. So getting something else in your cells which isn't human or getting other human cell lines in there if you're working with multiple cells. So contamination of cells, things like bacteria, yeast or fungi is the absolute dread of every scientist using cell culture. But unfortunately it does happen, but we can minimize the risk of that by using things like antibiotics. So those streptomycin and penicillin, as I mentioned earlier on. So we add these antibiotics to try and minimize the risk of growing things that we don't want because everything our cells need is everything that yeast and bacteria and fungi also need. So these are the absolute enemy and bane of everyone's life if you do cell culture. Now, when we get infections, it's normally pretty obvious we have a look under the microscope and there's lots of little black dots running around. That doesn't look right. So that's probably something growing there that shouldn't be. Um, the other thing, if you've got fungus, you get essentially a big furry thing growing in it that shouldn't be there. Uh, and if you get yeast, you open it and it smells like a lovely, freshly cooked batch of bread. So it smells lovely, but then you know something's gone wrong. So we can see that normally pretty easy, either under the microscope or by eye. But what is an issue is that they kind of gobble up all of the food and the gases that the cells on the dish need to ultimately kill them off and can completely change the growth environment for those cells. So we can't use them. They need to be thrown away and the incubator and everything needs to be cleaned down to try and reduce the risk of any other cells becoming contaminated. So in order to minimize the risk of getting bacteria and stuff into the plates, we do everything under what we call aseptic technique or sterile conditions. And in the video you will see briefly by our PhD student, Sean, he talks about aseptic technique and essentially you wipe everything down with ethanol, so alcohol, you wipe down your hands, you wipe down your gloves with this ethanol. Everything that goes into these hoods has to be completely sterile because we can't have yeast, bacteria, fungi everywhere, because it's going to get onto our cells and it's going to start growing in those dishes and ruin the experiment and hold up the research. So this aseptic technique, which Sean is going to talk a bit more about, helps prevent contamination by maintaining sterility. So trying to limit the bacteria, yeast and fungi that may potentially get into your cell line. So you work in this sterile flow cabinet and you wear gloves and spray everything with ethanol. In this video, we will be learning how to passage cells. We start with cells that have grown to cover most of the surface of the plate. To allow them to keep growing, we must split them and replate at a lower density. Here, we will show you how we do this in a research lab. Everything must be sterile whilst working with cells. A special sterile hood with filtered sterile air is used to carry out this procedure. All equipment used is first wiped down with ethanol before being placed in the hood. Sterile products and reagents are used to reduce the risk of outside contamination, such as mycoplasma. The researcher also wears gloves and wipes her hands down with ethanol before beginning the process. The researcher begins by removing the old growth media. This does not remove the cells as they are stuck down to the surface of the plate. Old media needs to be removed as it contains many waste products from the cells. <laughs> 
The cells are washed with phosphate buffered saline solution to remove waste and old media. The cells are then treated with trypsin, an enzyme that digests proteins, including those proteins that hold the cells to the surface of the plate. This reaction takes a few minutes, so the cells are placed back in a CO2 incubator whilst the trypsin does its job. After a few minutes in incubator, the researcher visually inspects the plate to see if the cells have detached. Now that the cells have detached from the plate, they are returned to the hood for the next few steps. Firstly, new growth media is added to the plate. The surface of the plate is washed several times with the media to make sure that all the cells are washed off the plate surface and into suspension in the new growth media. Resuspended cells are removed from the plate and transferred to a sterile falcon tube where the researcher pipettes the media up and down to ensure the cells are evenly resuspended and not in clumps. To a new culture plate, the researcher adds fresh growth media. She distributes it across the surface of the plate. Going back to the falcon tube containing the resuspended cells, she takes a small fraction of its volume containing only a small number of the original cells and adds this to the new culture plate. She gently mixes the replated cells and the media to evenly distribute the cells across the plate. The cells are now ready to be returned to the incubator to continue growing and dividing. Looking under a microscope, we can see that the cells are at a much lower density, giving them plenty of room to multiply. Okay. So that's all I have for you guys. Um, hopefully you find it interesting and that you now have a good understanding of what we mean by cell culture. And thank you very much to, to Sean and our researchers in the medical school for putting the video together. I think it really shows a lot of the, the concepts that we we're talking about. So I can see there's a couple of questions there, but, but do ask any other questions that you, that you have. And I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and pass over to, to my colleague Emma.
Thank you so much, Aidan. Really informative and um, exciting. And I think I've um, I've been in that lecture a number of times, and I always learn something new. So, thank you so much. Just those while we're still recording, if people are viewing this on record, just to say you've got specific questions for us, then we will still willing to hear from you. So please email us, and the email address to use is study at swansea.ac.uk. Okay, we can end the recording if that's okay, please, Aidan. Thank you. Okay, and now we, we've.